Yeah, I, that might be the reason. But otherwise, it makes no sense to me. And because the structure of the epic is not a small thing. It's, it's, like that's, it's a big thing. And he's changed it. You've had second thoughts, which again begs the question, if, if he thought this were de was <laughs> delivered to him by the, his celestial patroness, the Holy Spirit, and you're going you're gonna to mess with that? You're going to change it? So there, we, we mustn't take this, uh, his claim to be inspired at night by the Holy Spirit and wake up on, and, and write it down um, naively because uh, his biographers tell us that there are, there are nights when he didn't sleep at all because no inspiration came. None at all. And then other days where it came in full and a drive in huge quantities would be dealt with. So it didn't just, you know, I go to sleep, I wake up in the morning, oh, I'm happy, write these words down. It didn't happen like that. And the process continued. So his mind, his reasoning capacities were fused with the sense that, no, this is the way the Spirit of God is leaning me to that. And that included, I got it wrong the first time in terms of the structure. Let me tear that up and restructure it. But why would it be the 12 books? I think because of Virgil. He, he may more closely wants an explicit comparison with Virgil. Not Homer, Virgil. And, the, and, and as I say, C.S. Lewis calls this the secondary epic. So you could read Virgil and the subject of the secondary epic in Preface to Paradise Lost. This is a good book, by the way. I mean, I usually like C.S. Lewis, but I think this is very useful because it, it is what it purports to be. It is a preface. It's, it's helpful to understand the epic, which most modern critical works are not. They're giving you their opinions on what's good and great about the work. Sometimes they have very interesting opinions, but they don't help you read the book. They're giving you their reading of the book. Like I am when my, I'm lecturing. I'm giving you my impression, but it, to some degree, I'm, I'm trying to lean in the direction of Lewis. By yes, I'll throw my opinions in. I should. Fair enough. I've read it enough. I've spent enough time on it. But I'm also saying I'm here to equip you so that you can read the text with more understanding. Um, and I think that's what a good lecturer should do. So that, the the, so that the focus isn't on the lecturer, it's on the text. That's like, I would say the same thing in any text-based course, including scripture. What is the, like, what's the vantage point of the author here? And let's try and get in there and read it that way. And then we have to consider things I've talked about. Okay, so given the epic, Given what he writes, how about the reception of the epic? Why do we regard it as a great work? Who, uh, who else considered? Those are part of the consideration, surely. But, but the main point is to be able to read the text properly. And that's no small thing. Um, what's interesting here is that, again, in the, in the preface to the second edition, he appends a defense of his style. Not there in the first. I don't know if it's even here in this one. No, this is the Latin introduction by a friend of his. Um, but it's in your text here. The uh, Shawcross edition. The measure is English heroic verse without rhyme, as that of Homer in Greek and of Virgil in Latin. Rhyme being no necessary adjunct or true ornament of poem or good verse. In longer works especially, but the invention of a barbarous age to set off wretched matter and lame meter. Not without cause, therefore, some both Italian and Spanish poets of prime note have rejected rhyme as a thing of itself to all judicious ears, trivial and of no true musical delight, which consists only in apt numbers, fit quality of syllables, and the sense variously drawn out from one verse into another. So he's excusing why he doesn't follow the conventions of his day. Remember I said this is accommodation? So you, 
since it's an accommodation to the cultural norms of his day, he would be expected to write in rhyming couplets. And he says, I'm not going to do it. But he feels the need to justify that at the beginning. So he says, this neglect then of rhyme so little is to be taken for a defect that it is rather to be esteemed an example set, the first in English of ancient liberty recovered to heroic poem from the troublesome and modern bondage of rhyming. So it's a, again, the note of liberty, liberty now in terms of style. So I will use the conventions of the epic, yes, but I'm not going to use every last one if it is actually an impediment. I will be free from that. So again, it, it requires poetic judgment. Uh, whether he's successful or not in this, uh, opinions of very T.S. Eliot uh, thought that he was the greatest master in our language of freedom within form. There's a good way of putting it. The greatest master in our language of freedom within form. Now we have uh, the characteristic of our day is freedom without form. That would contradict Milton's own message of freedom within obedience to some degree. It's not absolute freedom. It's not freedom without limitations. The limitation is the form. And within that form, there is freedom. It's not going to bind himself too much. I'm going to, so here's the quote from Eliot. It is the period, the sentence, and still more the paragraph that is the unit of Milton's verse. A period I talked about as a rhetorical phrase, right? So there's a passage. Milton thinks in paragraphs, if you will. I mean, Milton, uh, even Eliot is accommodating here. Milton wouldn't have talked about paragraphs or sentences for that matter. He would talk about periods. But still, the, the long extended thought connected through colons, pairs and this to that, back and forth. Um, he says, the emphasis on the line structure is the minimum necessary to provide a counter pattern to the period structure. The minimum necessary. The peculiar feeling, almost a physical sensation of, of breathless leap communicated by Milton's long periods and by his alone is impossible to procure from rhymed verse. So it feels a bit like Homer and Virgil. If you're a classicist and have read the classical epics, it, it has the same sort of grand, lengthy thought patterns expressed in written language. Uh, here's Addison's comment. Another way of raising the language and giving it a poetical turn is to make use of the idioms of other tongues, like Greek and Latin and Italian. Milton, in conformity with the practice of the ancient poets and with Aristotle's rule, has infused a great many Latinism as well as Grecisms and sometimes Hebraisms into the language of his poem. Under this head may be reckoned the placing the adjective after the substantive. So you will know if you know French or Spanish or Italian, you put the adjective after the noun. The transposition of words, the turning the adjective into a substantive with several other foreign modes of speech, which this poet has naturalized to give his verse a the greater sound and throw it out of prose. So he, he gets this because of his acquaintance with other languages. And he brings those conventions into the English language and it sounds extraordinary. There is no other poet quite like him. Later poets will emulate Milton's style in this, but when they do this, they're taking English and marrying it with other languages. Part of the universal scope of it is really taking 
stylistic features from multiple languages and chiefly from those that are influential on biblical thinking, Hebrew, Latin, Greek. Latin because the language of the church is Latin. Um, some have criticized them for the Latin. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really with them. I think it's less Latin than they claim. But there is some there. There's no doubt about it. <coughs> so how does it begin? Um, so it begins also with these arguments throughout, which is a funny old thing. Again, what is with this? Why append an argument to the epic? Because I can think of no precedent for this. This is the poet. This isn't an editor giving a synopsis of the plot, which we're about to get. That's, at the that's what the argument is. In each of the 12 books, there is an argument at the beginning. And it is just a summary. So if you wa are just looking for what happens in the book, just read the four arg 12 arguments and then you're done. That's quick. <laughs> what happens in Paradise Lost? Well, read the argument 12 times. Done. That was quick. Over. I don't have to bother with the rest of it. Why does he do this? It's an extraordinary thing. Homer doesn't do it. Virgil doesn't do it. Is it <laughs> because uh, he thinks his own style is too complex and convoluted to get people to follow what he's saying? So he has to tell them in advance. They don't get lost along the way. You got to put breadcrumbs along the way so you can find your way through the deep, dark woods of Milton's uh, prose style. I don't know. But it's a, it, it is interesting. And it is something like a, a gloss. Uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge will do something like it, although also differ from it when he writes uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. He'll put a gloss in the margin. But there it actually deviates from what going on in the poem at points, whereas Milton's is always telling you exactly what happens and not deviating it from it. To some degree, it functions almost the same way that when you, read, when you have those Bibles, uh, the study Bibles, where in the, in the uh, footnotes, it tells you what's going on, the thrust of the argument. And so if you're doing the study with a bunch of people and say, well, what's going on here? Then they read from the bottom and tell you what's going on. I think, well, okay, that's what the editor thinks. That doesn't necessarily encapsulate everything. But here it's the poem, poet himself who is presenting it. So there's no really way of saying this isn't what's going on. And in a sense, because it's presenting the argument, you can't misread it. And maybe that's why. You can't misread it. You cannot say, that Satan is the hero when you read the argument. What does the argument say? This fir first proposes, first and brief, the whole subject, man's disobedience, the loss thereupon of paradise, wherein he was placed, then touches the prime cause of his fall, the serpent, or rather Satan and the serpent, who revolting from God and drawing to his side many legions of angels, was by the command of God driven out of heaven with all his crew into the great deep, which action passed over the poem, hastes into the midst of things. Another epic convention, by the way, begins in medias race. That's what uh, Horace says good epics should do. They should begin right in the middle. So it, ha it hastes right there, presenting Satan with his angels now fallen. So why? Because it's gone right to the middle of things. That's why. So he begins there. And then he's going to backtrack. It's not because he wants to present Satan in heroic terms for us to admire him, but just because it's the beginning. Maybe he misjudged it and he shouldn't have begun with Satan. But the reason he did is, this is the middle point. Well, when, what is the beginning point then? Well, he begins before the world was even created then. He, it's, the, it's the perspective of Revelation 12. He's giving us the war in heaven before the earth has even been created. There's a fight. A cosmic battle between God and the angels and a third of the stars of heaven are cast down to the earth. That's what he sees there. So he doesn't begin in Genesis. That's the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, but it's not the account of 
the powers that existed before that. So that's why. So it's presenting Satan and these angels now fallen into hell described here. Not in the center. So this is also important. The center of the action is not in hell. For heaven and earth may be supposed as yet not made, certainly not yet accursed, but in a place of utter darkness, fitly is called chaos. So interesting. He already is alluding to something here, right? So now he's explaining why he begins where he begins. I, I think critics have ignored the argument to some degree in speculating on Satan. I, I think you can't, they, they overlook the argument maybe. Here, Satan with his angels lying in the burning lake, thunderstruck and astonished, after a certain space, recovers as from confusion calls up to him, who next in order and dignity lay by him. They confer of their miserable fall. Satan awakens all his legions who lay till then in the same manner confounded. They rise, their numbers, array of battle, their chief leaders named according to the idols known afterwards in Canaan and the countries adjoining. To these, Satan directs his speech, comforts them with hope yet of regaining heaven but tells them lastly of a new world and a new kind of creature to be created according to an ancient prophecy or report in heaven. For that angels were long before this visible creation was the opinion of many ancient fathers. To find out the truth of this prophecy and what to determine thereon he refers to a full council. What his associates thence attempt, pandemonium, the palace of Satan rises, suddenly built out of the deep, the infernal peers there sit in council. There's the whole argument of the whole book, but he's explaining why he begins where he begins right there. Right? I don't know why people don't take the, the argument more to be a part of the poem. The author himself, the poet, gives us the argument. It's not an editor. It is authoritative weight. Right? It's, not, it's not the, uh, the explanation of the verse which he appends before this about using unrhymed uh, iambic pentameter. That's, the expl that's an, uh, an, a, a preface, but this is a part of the poem. Does that make any sense to you? I, th I think it's very important that you see the argument as part of the poem. And when you do, then it pushes us away from the view that Milton Satan is the hero immediately. That's how I take it at any rate. Let's look at the, um, what have I got? Yeah, I got 10 minutes, that's enough. Let's look at the Invocation of the Muse, which is an epic convention in Homer and Virgil. Translated by Dryden, okay, very good. If we get there eventually, slow, slow, slow. Virgil's uh, poem begins, of arms and of a man I sing. Of the arms, he'll probably be referring to the Iliad, of the man, probably to Odysseus. I'm referring in my one epic to the two epics of Homer. He writes two 24-book epics. I'm going to write one 12-book epic. A in my epic, I will do what Virgil takes two to write about. One is about a war, Achilles, the fall of Troy. The other is about the return home from that war, Odysseus. Uh, Aeneas will wander like Odysseus in the first six books of the Aeneid. and the second six, he has a war to found the city of Rome. It's a lot of structure. This is just not working at all. 
maybe it didn't. I'll try another one. This one, oh, this is Latin. I don't really want that. Uh, actually, I'm not sure it is Latin. Invocation of the Muse. I sing of arms and the man who, exiled by fate, first came from the coast of Troy to Italy, etc. So again, right at the outset, typical of the epic, Milton's theme. Uh, so in, in that secondary epic of Virgil, you can see that he's already alluding to the foregoing epic. That is an epic convention already. It's a, it's a work in dialogue with its predecessors. But it's also an invocation. The muse, the muse, the muses, there are nine of them. I've already mentioned that, I think. And there's one particularly dedicated to epic poetry. And that muse is the one that M Milton begins with here. Virgil sung of arms and of a man, and the man that he will put to the forefront of his epic is none other than Pius Aeneas who will found Rome, who, which becomes the city of Augustus Caesar, the great city of the Roman Empire, under whom there was a Pax Romana. There, the empire is the whole world of Rome, and he says it's going to be an eternal city. The city will not fall. And a golden age of peace is upon us, says Augustus in his proclamations. So it's a grand theme. It's not just any old man. It's the man that founds a an empire which extends the whole known world. Milton's theme needs to be greater yet. If he's going to outdo the previous epics, how does he then begin? He actually begins not with an achievement, but with the opposite of an achievement. Again, inverting the epic conventions right from the first line of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or of Zion Hill delight thee more and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit that dost prefer before all temples the upright and pure, instruct me. For thou knowest, thou from the first wast presence and with mighty wings outspread dove-like sats brooding on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine. What is low, raise and support. That to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Justification fits the logical structure of an argument, the argument at the beginning. He's trying to justify, show the, re the reasonable nature of what has happened. It's accommodation from the vantage point of a, an earthly man, the way God has operated, even though God's counsels are hidden from us, from our vantage point, what's the best way of seeing it based on how he has revealed himself in his book of grace? How do I see it? But he begins, as I say, with a, a note of total failure, already breaks the epic conventions right there. The Iliad begins with the rage of Achilles. First word is rage in the Iliad. It's characteristic of Achilles' character. It's the, thing, it's the reason that the Trojan War is stalled and the Greeks won't win because there is a massive sulk on behalf of Achilles uh, because his prize girl Briasis has been taken away from him by Agamemnon, and he says, if you take away my prize, I won't fight for you. You're, you dishonor me, and I will not honor you with the victory. And he sulks for half of the epic. So there is a sort of a failure there, but this is worse than that. 
it's disobedience and it's disobedience to the gods. There's no sense that Achilles is being disobedient to the gods. There's no such theological framework. That's not what the problem here is. We have a man who has been dishonored by the great king, Agamemnon. Okay, that's a fight between men. But, and he may have angered the gods. And we, we know that in the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, there is a machinery of, of, of gods fighting over this. There are different sides. Juno's on the one side. Um, uh, on the side of the Greeks, Athena. So they're, they're having a little battle there as well, and that drives it to some degree, but it's not taken that the human beings are fighting against the will of the gods in totem, but here it is, because there's only one god, of course. That's one reason, but there's the, uh, uh, so there's a greater theological stress here in the very first line of man's first disobedience. Note that it's not the last but it's the one that is instrumental to everything that follows. That's the other thing. This is not just any old event. It's not just that it recounts the stories of a Greek prince, great in his deeds such that we still speak of Achilles and know who he is. Talk about him in Achilles heel even, even though it's not told in the Iliad, that aspect of the story, a great man and the battle of Troy, known throughout human history. This is more important. It's all humanity that is connected to this one event. First line, failure. How does that change the whole epic? It utterly transforms it. If it's man's first disobedience that's the subject matter of the epic, then it, there can be no human heroism that is the subject matter of the epic thereafter. Because, and that's corrected right away. The fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe all our woe, no exceptions, with loss of Eden, till, and now he announces the second man, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Now he, re, now he introduces the hero. Here's the great villain. Adam is the great villain, not even Satan. Satan gets a lot of bad publicity here and he deserves it. But actually the great villain of the human race to some degree is Adam. Man is the great villain of this piece and the great hero of this piece is also man. The second Adam, it's a, it's a, it's a hymn. Praise to the holiest in the heights. Um, and man on earth give praise. A second Adam to the fight and for our rescue came. The second Adam is Christ, the biblical language. This is a second attempt. Now what's a second Adam going to do? First of all, resist all the temptations that the first Adam gave, fell prey to. That'll be the temptation in the wilderness. But it also, so that's the 40 days, the, the, but also all of the other temptations. What are those temptations? Despair, whales in the garden of Gethsemane, sweats blood, ask for the cup to be taken from him, if it could be, but not his will, but God's be done. And on the cross cries out, why have you forsaken me? Those things, uh, God, Adam was never forsaken until he abandoned God. Christ was forsaken, though he was always true to God. That's because he bore our sins on the tree of uh, the cross. So a very different, I'm, I'm not going to get through this now because obviously I've run out of time, but uh, I just wanted the first few lines and how this is going to influence then the whole trajectory of the epic, and it does. And I'll pick it up. I'll come back to this next time and we'll say more about book one, okay?